Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of the Better Off Podcast. Today, we're talking about how organizations can operate at peak performance. Talking to a friend of mine, he says, you know, I I don't think it's work-life balance anymore. It's work-life harmony. What you're looking for is harmony because there are times when your life has to be out of balance. If you're studying for your doctorate or, or you've got a big project, you have to put your family aside. You have to put your personal life aside. And so I think what you're looking for is harmony. Mm-hmm. Have I invested so, so much into one part where I'm out of harmony? Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. You know, when you think about organizations, they are so diverse. Each one has its own nuance. But today we have a way to kind of help everybody either manage a team better or become a better team member. Our guest, Chester Elton, is the author of a new book called The Best Team Wins, The New Science of High Performance. Now, you may have seen this guy. I don't know if you're on LinkedIn or not, but he is a best-selling business author, and he is an expert in organizational culture, employee engagement, and leadership. So stay tuned. Here's my interview with Chester Elton. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Chester Elton, the Apostle of Appreciation. And lover of orange, welcome to the Better Off Podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. We start the podcast with one very important question. You ready? You bet. What's the best financial or career decision you've ever made? Yeah, great question. Mine was is I worked at companies that had matching. They had matching funds. And they'd match up to 3%. The smartest thing I ever did was max that out every time. That's free money. And then just forget about it. Payroll deduction to me is what saved my life. If I didn't have it, I didn't spend it. And over time, it compounded. And it was a lot of money when I left. You got a new book. You've written a bunch of books. Uh, and it's called The Best Team Wins, The New Science of High Performance. Why'd you write this book, Chester? Well, really interesting. For Adrian and I, he's my co-author. And we've been writing for almost 20 years now on how you create these great workplaces, high productivity places. And, you know, we started in recognition. We wrote The Carrot Principle, and it's the Apostle of Appreciation. And we found some great indicators went up when people felt valued and appreciated. You know, more carrots, less sticks. Well, we figured out very quickly that if you didn't get the culture right, the recognition didn't matter. So we wrote a book called All In, How the Best Managers Create This Culture of Belief. Sequencing to that, we said, look, the best cultures have people doing not just what they're good at, but what they're passionate about. So we took a lot of data and we wrote a book called uh, What Motivates Me? Put Your Passions to Work. As part of that natural progression, we said, look, in every organization you have smaller teams and the teams are charged with delivering on the promise of the culture, innovation, on-time delivery, customer service, whatever it might be. So we took a really deep dive on teams because that's the microcosm of your organization. And we looked at 850,000 engagement surveys. We looked at 50,000 of our own motivator surveys. And what we found is, is that everything you knew about teams, you basically need to throw out. What? Hold on a second. (laughs) So what's the misconception? What is it that people think is going on about teams? Well, when you get down to that team leader level and and the micro team is you're looking at the rules. And, you know, organizations over time develop all kinds of rules. And old school is, uh, you know, the rules apply to everybody because that's fair. The new rules is know your people. You've got to manage to the one. You've got to manage one-on-one. And the reason you've got to kind of throw out what you've, what you've learned in the past is never before has it been more complicated. You've got gig employees. You've got five generations. You've got, you know, remote employees. You've got contract employees. If you're in healthcare, you've got volunteers. And it's diversity, not just in gender and race, but it's, it's thought, it's tradition, it's languages. And so all these kind of rules that we grew up with on how to form business teams really don't apply that much anymore. That's amazing. So what is it that makes a good team? Well, getting the right people in the right jobs doing, again, what I said, not just what they're good about, what they're passionate about. But how do you know start. that? I mean, like sometimes you don't know where your passion lies. Uh, yeah. Did- well, that's why we actually put together our, our own little survey. You know, you'd go online and take it. It would it would rank order them for you. And there's and there's lots of those kinds of things out there. You've taken a Myers-Briggs or a Yeah, but that's finder. crap. I have to say that. <laughs> I mean, that, those those surveys... I took that when I was applying for a job at a big private equity firm, and it comes back and says, like, you can't do this, you should do this, you can't do this, you should do this. And it was completely wrong as it turned out for my career. That was a bad read on my character. 
Well, here, here's 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 why we did what we did. Because in some ways I agree with you, in some ways I don't. One is I what? Think, <laughs> I, Mark, get him out of here. I only want people who agree with us. <laughs> yeah, harmony is overrated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we actually wrote that in the book. Anyway, um, you know, Myers Briggs is supposed to tell you a little bit about who you are, right? Uh, strength finder is kind of what you're good at. We went to the passion part, you know, and and uh, again, the, the thing about teams that you've got to forget is. You know, it used to be you had a work life and then you had your, you know, religious life or your athletic life or whatever. Now with smartphones, you've got one life and it bleeds into everything. So this idea of getting to know what people are really passionate about is we have what we call aspirational conversations. So not the reviews that you do, you know, semi-annually or annually, but you sit down and they take 10 or 15 minutes and you just start with some key questions. You know, uh, have we kept our promises to you? What do you think we do well around here? What, what do you think we could do better? I think one of the key questions is where do you want to be three to five years from now? And, and I think these conversations on a regular basis, the, the really extraordinary team leaders do it. And so I get to know you as a person. I get to know where you're going. I'm checking in with you often because, you know, what you're passionate about changes. Your life changes. You get married. You have children. Your, your mom or dad pass away or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so good leaders understand that this managing to the one and having aspirational conversations, that's how you get uh, what people are passionate about. Let's say you've got more than one person who's passionate about the same thing, but there's only one role. What do you do? Yeah, that, that's that's something we we call job sculpting, actually. And so you you bring the team together. And this is another thing that's, you know, breaking down sort of the barriers, the hierarchical. I'm the team captain and, you know, you're going to do what I say because I've got the title and you don't. It's much more collaborative now. So you get together as a team and you say, look, here's what we've got to do. Here are we have some strengths. Here we have some passions. Here we have some expertise. Let's get together and figure out what's who's the best for the job and how are we going to deliver uh, to what we need to deliver. That's interesting, though, because I remember there was a time when I was running a company um, and there was a consultant that came in and said, you continually are managing to the people you have. And what you need to do, this was what the consultant said, was figure out what the organization needs and then fill those roles, that you shouldn't do it the opposite way. And you, I think, are saying that you should do it the opposite way. Well, there are certain things that you have to get done, right, right. within the organization. I mean, you know, you've got to get reports to customers or whatever. In that context, you've got to make sure that you're, you're, you, you've structured your team to deliver at the highest level. You know, it's funny. We had five really uh, big ahas in the book. And, of course, the fifth one is don't forget the customer. And this is what your friend's talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, we get these great teams. We get everybody passionate. Everybody's happy. Everybody's, you know, uh, fine. Why? Well, so that we can deliver a product and service, you know, to gain more customers and, and more loyal customers. You've been doing this for a while, this, this idea of looking at – the employee-employer relationship and how to create a workforce that is more engaged and passionate. What's changed, say, in the last 10 years? Yeah, you know, uh, interesting. Um, one of my friends was saying, look, I read the book, loved it. Um, what was your biggest aha? And I think the biggest change over the last 10 years is we used to look at CVs and resumes for whether they're leaders or team members, and we'd go to expertise, we'd go to education, we'd go to, you know, experience. And what we found is that good leaders technically had good technical skills. Good teams, they had good technical skills. The extraordinary teams had great soft skills. Never before have soft skills been more valuable. That's interesting. We interviewed a guy who wrote a book um, in defense of a liberal arts education, and he said just <laughs> that. He said one of the reasons that a lot of people who have a, a liberal arts education is that they tend to have, they embrace their soft skills. It doesn't mean that an engineer can't have soft skills, but it does mean the value of that expertise only goes so far. And it's funny that we created almost an entire category of worker that is in the interface between the engineer and the sales staff called you know, product manager, right. right? So what is, is there a generational difference? Because you know, there's so many people who who have said, well, millennials, they want to be treated differently at work. And then there's an old fart like me and being like, oh, tough luck. You know, this is the way it is. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about generationally how you have seen the differences emerge? Absolutely. Our, our first big aha was you've got to learn how to manage generations. And not just millennials, but Gen X, you know, baby boomers. There's a few traditionals. And, and now, you're depending on your industry, you've even, even got the Gen, Gen Z mm -hmm. coming in. Uh, and so 
Yes, generally she's very different. I mean, you're different than your parents. I'm as different than my parents. I'm not that different than my parents, which is, I mean, that's why I say I'm an old fart, because I am officially Gen X, but I act more like a boomer in terms of the way that we looked at an organization was, and, you know, that's the boss, the boss's rule, blah, 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 blah. You do what you're told to do. You have, you have to shovel the crap for a while for the first few years. You don't have a say. You know, all that stuff. But it is different when I hear about employers who are saying, you know, these kids, they want a voice. Like, why should I give them a voice? They don't know anything. It's like almost saying to a resident, like the resident is not going to say to the attending physician, "Um, why don't you do it that way? Right. It is hierarchical and they do it for a reason because you don't know anything. Sure. Well, and depending on your industry, it becomes more. I mean, you're right. If, if you know, you're a neurosurgeon and the kid's just out of school, I don't think you're going to. Is that you know? the brain? Yes, that's yes, the brain. Yes, it is rocket but, science. But what is it that that why is engagement so important? Well, well, you make two good points. The first is, is that it, we tend to categorize people. Oh, you're a millennial. Oh, you're a Gen X. Oh, you're. A, and it's, it's never that simple. Right. So what we did is we looked at trends. And one of the trends we saw with millennials was that top three motivators in the workplace was impact. Mm -hmm. So they want to make, you know, not just what I do, but, you know, why is it important, right? Secondly was learning. Am I growing and developing? So again, as you're you're getting, you know, newer workers into the workforce, do they have a career path? Are you checking in with them? Where do you want to be two to three years from now? Because one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, um, baby boomers, you had maybe two or three jobs in a career. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, millennials, you can have two or three jobs in a year. Mm -hmm. And so that became very important. Thirdly, which was really interesting to us was family. Family was really important. And I, I, as we delved into that, uh, what, what our, our best guess is, is they saw their parents work forever at one place mm-hmm. and, and then the crash happened and they didn't get their pensions and they didn't, you know what I mean? And so their idea of going to one place and investing 25 or 30 years, not interested. Again, we don't have eight to five. It's it's twenty four seven. So I want to have a, a work where I've got enough flexibility so I can have work and I can have a life. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Chester Elton in just a moment. You know, we've just come through tax season and there really is no better time to kind of get a grip on your whole financial life than now. So yeah, maybe the first thing you do is you create a file called 2018 Taxes. And in that file, just put this year's return. And then throughout the year, you can put all your relevant receipts and statements and uh, various property tax bills, etc. But what you also may want to do is take a look at whether or not you were tax efficient this year. You know, if you had a lot of churn in the account. Well, that's where our sponsor Betterment comes in. Everything that Betterment does is designed to lower taxes and increase returns. And Betterment can provide you with personalized advice for your financial planning needs. Based on the information you tell them, Betterment makes tailored recommendations on decisions like how much to invest, how much risk to take on in your portfolio, and the type of investment account you should have. Stop wandering around in the wilderness. Get a grip on what's going on. Use this time of year to do it. Just go to Betterment.com slash better off. And now back to our interview with Chester Elton. Um, I met a woman who is like blew my mind. She's a wonderful manager. And she said something that really resonated. She said, it's completely great to have a work-life balance. But there are certain points in your career where if you really want that balance, you may be foregoing right. an upward trajectory. Yeah. No, I, 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 this is a great – you'll use this because I, I think work-life balance is, is, is hard because then you're saying, well, I'm giving up something for something else. Um, talking to a friend of mine, he says, you know, I, I don't think it's work-life balance anymore. It's work-life harmony. Hmm. What you're looking for is harmony, because there are times when your life has to be out of balance. You, 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 you got to, you know, if you're studying for your doctorate or, or you've got a big project, you can't, you, you have to put your family aside. You have to put your personal life aside. And so I think what you're looking for is harmony. Mm-hmm. Have I invested so, so much into one part where I'm out of harmony? Mm. And that's, that's the key. And I, and I like that philosophy much better. I, I think that is interesting. So to be harmonious, it almost requires the both sides to communicate much more openly and honestly, right? Exactly. See, for me, Jill, it's all about communication. 
right? How are we communicating with the different generations, with the different, you know, in different languages, in different cultures? It's all about communication, and that is a soft skill. Can it be learned? Absolutely. How so? Absolutely. Tell me about that. Well, you know, it's really interesting. You talk about coaches that come in and so on. And uh, and I, I don't think, I, I hate the term life coach. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, that's a, so funny because we used to like make fun of that. Like, oh, he's, she's a life coach. Like, huh? Well, yeah. Well, that's that weird. That. I, I love the coaches that come in and say, look, let's work on two things that you want to get better. Yeah. At. And let's really focus on that. Let's let's get other people to buy in. You've got stakeholders. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really interesting. I've been experimenting uh, this with my kids. So I said to my kids, how can I be a better dad? And to I cannot even believe you asked that question. You're the best dad. <laughs> how many kids do you have? Four. But each kid is viewing your fatherhood through a different lens. Absolutely. I, I say my four kids are four points on the compass. They couldn't be more different. Right. right? Okay. So, so, two, two so tell boys, me. Well, so two of my boys came back and said, you know what? I want you to spend more time with me. Uh, I like it when you spend time with me, but you usually invite other people along or, you know, it's, it's a part. I, I want one-on-one -on -one time. Wow. And it was really interesting because I write my kids letters, which is really old school. Yeah, I and love they say, that. We like the letters, but I like the conversations better. So here's what's key. Um, about this coaching piece is uh, after a while I'd say, okay, I, I'm going to make that commitment. And I said to my son, Brendan, I said, so how am I doing? He goes, huh, yeah, you know, um, let me think about that. Well, it was too general. So I came back to him and I said, hey, Brynn, you know, I, I promised I'd spend more time. Here. Have you noticed that when you come into my office, I turn away from my computer and I shut off my phone and we have one-on-one -on -one focus time? I love that. Yeah. And he said, you know, you do do that. I said, have you noticed that when you were away, I would call you later at night and we would have an uninterrupted conversation for at least 20 minutes. He goes, you know what, Dad, you, did, you know what, you are doing better. So that's interesting because you do a ton of traveling. <laughs> yes. Right. And so there are, I mean, not just for your personal life, but let's just presume you were a manager and you're, you're doing a ton of traveling. Asking your employees, what is it you need for me when I'm on the road? must be an interesting, that would be interesting feedback to get because I think some people feel a little bit lost when the boss is out of the office. And so the the different means of communication and what you need, but I think it has to come from the boss, right? Absolutely. Well, see, that's part of those aspirational conversations. You know, a lot of the questions I like is, what's the best way for me to get a hold of you? Mm -hmm. You know, my, my kids are basically millennials, yeah. you know, and I call them on the phone and they text me back, you know, and I, <laughs> so I, and then my son Garrett, I said, hey, Garrett, I'm paying your tuition, your room and board when your dad calls pickup. Yeah. And he does now, right? He, yeah. He does. So we, we, so it was, it was interesting. It was kind of like, I get that to text you, but you know, when I call, I want to talk to you again, soft skills. I think what's tough, Jill, is that these soft skills, these aspirational conversations, it, it's the soft stuff, but for most managers, it's the hard stuff. So can it be learned? Absolutely. It's a discipline. Mm -hmm. Now I do want to share one story with you. Really good uh, study that we did. And, and we, we met this fascinating guy named um, Chris Hadfield. Not a name that you'd know. If you're Canadian, you know exactly who he is. Okay. He's a Canadian astronaut. Okay. And yes, Canada has astronauts. <laughs> I was just about to ask. I, I mean, I, I didn't know if that would be kosher to ask such a question. There's but... been three. Okay? okay. The most famous is probably Chris Hadfield. In fact, on the back of the Canadian $5 bill, they've got him doing his spacewalk. Mm. Total props. Because awesome. he replaced hockey players, by the way. If you're going to replace hockey players in Canada, you better be a big Chester, deal. Chester, an unabashed hockey fan. Absolutely. Go Devils. Anyway. So it, 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 here's what was interesting. We studied him, and he was the commander of the International Space Station. So mm -hmm. six astronauts, actually three cosmonauts, two American astronauts, and himself. And he said, you know, they trained for over 10 years to get up there. Phenomenal. Mm. So he looked at his team, and he said, look, I've got multi-generation. I've got difference in thought, diversity, and language. He literally moved to Russia and learned how to speak fluent Russian because he didn't want a communication background. That's commitment. I mean, oh these are really Oh, my God. That's amazing. Yeah. So he says, look, we go up there, we're six months in a confined space, you know, floating in a tin can, literally. Yeah. And he said, we exceeded every goal we set. It was one of the most productive missions in NASA's history up in the space station. So he said, why? He said, look, we were technically proficient. Back to, I know what to do and how to do it. We prepared for every disaster because if something goes wrong in the space station, you can't fix it, you know, people die. He said, but that wasn't the key to our success. He says, all the written rules, got it. All the technical stuff, got it. But we had one unwritten rule that made all the difference, and it was this, that every astronaut had to perform one random act of kindness for every other astronaut every day. Now, really? Now think about that. And not big things. I'll, I'll clean up. Let me help you with the calculations, whatever. Little things. He said, because of that, we never had a heated argument. We never had uh, hurt feelings. 
we were together, we were collaborative. Because the message is, when you do it every day, is I'm cheering for you. I got your back. I'm here to help. I, I care about you. I love you. That's interesting because how do you how can you extrapolate that into a workplace where you've got tons and tons of people, right? You can't do it that. You can't say do one random act of kindness for every team member if there's 50 people on the team. Can you say do three random acts of kindness on a given day to anyone? Yeah. See, Tesco, you know, the big the yep. grocery store, they, they their reputation for forever really high tanked, brought in new leadership, right? Changed everything. And they, and they said, look, we can't legislate our way out of this damaged reputation, but we can behave our way out of it, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was really interesting. They, they challenged, they had 300,000 employees in the UK alone. And he challenged him. He said, I, I want to challenge you to, to have one random act of kindness a day, just one. Mm-hmm. For a customer or, 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 or somebody on your team. He said, think about it. That's 300,000 random acts of kindness every day. We're open seven days a week. 2.1 million random acts of kindness every week. And they adopted a philosophy. It was on all their trucks and everything. The littles matter. Hmm. And so they were little things. Instead of just telling somebody where the stuff is, walk them to the aisle. My favorite story is this uh, woman and her daughter are checking out. And uh, the checkout guy notices that they're kind of nervous. And he notices, and this was one of the ones that had a pharmacy that they had uh, diabetes medication. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, and he could tell that that's what they were nervous about. And he said, you know, um, isn't that interesting? I take that same medication. I'm a diabetic. Don't be nervous. Diabetics are awesome. This is going to work great for you. And then he pulls out a little toy and he gives it to the little girl. Didn't have to do it. One random act of kindness. What do you think the ripple effect was for that customer and that loyalty? See, that's culture. The littles do matter. Maybe you can't do it for everybody every day because your team's big. Right. But you can do one a day. So let me go back to something that you said earlier, and I want to just stay on this for a second. You've got carrots, you've got sticks, right. and there's different things that motivate different people. And I think that you were the person who told me years ago when we first met that paying people more is not actually the motivating factor. Is that correct still? Well, again, know your people. For some people, it is going to be a motivator. For others, it's a satisfier. And interesting, back to the millennials, we, 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 we determined there were 23 key motivators at work. For most millennials, money is number 23. Get out of here. Now, it's not that it's not important. Right. It's a satisfier. It's not a motivator. 23, though? I mean, you still got to pay. Is that because their parents are still supporting them? <laughs> they got no rent. They're living in the basement. No, what I'm saying is it's important. And, and, and we talked to some millennial experts. There are those people out there. And they said, no, no, they'll negotiate very hard up front for as much money as they can. However, as soon as I'm in the workplace, I'm looking for my like, learning experiences, more experiential stuff, opportunities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my paycheck. You've seen this happen with your employees. Everybody gets a 3% raise. Right. How long did that yippee last? No, not to forget about it. Two weeks. Before we go, I do want to ask you about this idea that of of equity in the workplace. What happens when one class of employees gets paid a lot more than the other? And here's what I'm thinking about. You work in lots of different kinds of organizations. Oftentimes, the salespeople make a ton more than the people who are in the middle or back office. And is that fair? You know, um, I guess the answer is yes and no, depending on what your culture is and depending how that's communicated. Well, how do you feel about that? You know, I, I grew up in sales. You know, I like that you eat what you kill. And, and, and for me, I made more as a salesperson, but I had a lot more at risk. You know, most of my sales jobs, I was totally commission-based. Mm-hmm. If I didn't sell, I didn't get. Back office, less risk, less money, but stability. So I, I think, again, it comes back to communication. Do we all get why? I used to always say to my back end people, they'd say, well, you know, the sales guys make so much more. I go, great, go sell. Well, I can't do that. I go, then, then you've made your choice. That's what I say to people who say it's not that hard to read a teleprompter. I'm like, okay, you do it. Exactly. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's harder than it looks. It absolutely is. Uh, okay. Chester Elton, thank you so much for being with us today. We are finishing our interview with a bookend question to our opening question. Okay. You said, your best financial decision was putting that money into your retirement account and getting the match. What's the worst financial decision or career decision you made? Yeah, the worst financial decision I made is I went into business with a friend. 
And I gave him a lot of money, and I I regret it every day. Even now, it haunts me. Oh, no. So you're no longer friends, and you no longer have the money. I no longer have the money. We're still friends. You're not friends. Well. That's such a dear fitting. <laughs> Come on. I'm working on it. All right. Chester, thank you so much for joining us. You got it. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, it's time for the listener question of the week. If you would like to weigh in on whatever's going on in your financial life, give us a holler. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. Two chances every week to get on the program. Once after the interview segment on Thursdays, we drop that. And then on Tuesdays, we drop the bonus call of the week. So give us a holler. We'd love to help you out. Today, we've got John from Ohio on the line. Hello, John. What can we do for you? Hi, Jill. Thanks for bringing me on to the podcast. Sure. Uh, appreciate uh, all that you do for us. Um, so I've got a question on um, retirement. I, it's mainly more of maybe just a question on um, explaining how uh, the best way to ensure that you're leaving money on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, where I work, uh, we get uh, like 50% of the first 6% is matched by the company and paid on a monthly basis. So if you don't contribute in that first you know, in a month, you don't get any money. I guess maybe you could explain more of what that means. Because to me, that means that like 3% of what I contribute is what they're going to match. But I'm not sure why the 50% of the first 6% is. It's just a weird wording. number. Believe me, I don't know where that came into effect either. But it's sort of the standard. I would say that most of corporate America has somehow chosen that 50% up to up to 6% as the level. Who knows why? I'm sure that like some big company figured it out and then the rest followed. So, but it is a pretty standard benefit. Okay. During our yearly review of the 401k plans, um, it was informed that the contribution from the company is not counted against the 18.5. Right. Um, Correct. That, okay. Um, then my next question will be on um, how to diversify within a 401k. Um, currently, I'm pretty much in like a growth funds and uh, target date is what I switched to here recently. Okay. Um, now, wait a second. Just one quick question. How old are you? I'm 32. We'll be 33 this year. Okay. Got it. Just give me a bigger picture about who you are, what's going on, and you know what what you've done so far. Um, I make about 90000 a year, mm-hmm. plus some bonuses um, in uh, retirement right now. Uh, through the, the 401k, I've got about 145 mm-hmm. uh, through a Roth IRA. Thanks to my parents contributing when I was younger, uh, I had like 130. 130 uh, in the Roth, huh? That's great. Uh, and then I have about 120 in cash. That's my emergency fund. Why so much? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I'm not really sure what to do with it. Um, for the bank that I use, uh, I get the best perks as long as I keep over 100. Mm-hmm. And I'm just not sure what I should do to I should drop below that for, I guess, lower perks and, or uh, have that money do more for me. Um, I, I didn't know if you felt like, my look, I keep a little bit more because my job is it. I mean, look, 90 grand a year is a, is a great number in salary. But, you know, you've, you've got more than a year of expenses in the bank is my right. guess. So I just was wondering if there's some reason you have that extra money in there. I mean, it's okay uh, if you say to me, so, you just like it. <laughs> yeah, for the, for the most part, it, it's uh, everything's on autopilot as much as I can. Uh, and I just keep forgetting to do something with it because I have to like send it over and, and call the uh, broker at Edward Jones to invest it. And it's just oh. more of I, I've been slow to do stuff. Why Edward Jones? Is that where the Roth it, is? That's where my Roth is. They're probably essentially buying something where they can make money on you, right? Presumably? That would be my thought. And that's kind of what I was starting to wonder is um, uh, I asked him, the, the, the financial advisor my mom has used, is basically it's my parents. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's the one who will help fix the, the placement in my company's 401k uh-huh. and, com- and, and, of course, with my actual retirement with them. So I have other funds that aren't in the Roth. He was saying he didn't indicate that the employee contribution or the employer contribution did anything different. So, like, it seems like I'm not, maybe not getting the best advice. Maybe not. So, okay, let's not trash the dude. So, I mean, he's done well for my parents. And, yeah, and I mean, one of those, like, and it may be that guys. they they may be need, they may need something else from him. But I mean, if it sounds right. to me like you know, look, you you've got a fairly straightforward financial situation. I'm young. I've got a bunch of money that's in there for retirement. How can I best allocate that to get 
yeah. what I need, right? And Absolutely. in that case, you know, you, you basically have two big choices. One is, do I just do this on my own and pick an index fund environment? Do I do this on my own and pick a robo-advisor like our sponsor, Betterment? You know, what are my choices? And that's essentially what you're, what you're looking at. Because clearly, working with a commission-based broker who's going to sell you maybe a fine mutual fund, but it's going to be more expensive than whatever you're going to pay and either of those other two options doesn't really make a ton of sense for someone in your situation because you're not asking for like other financial advice. It's asset allocation. Asset allocation, in my mind, it's a commodity, right? And so if you don't need advice and you're just looking at commodities, then let's look at the meaning the the fund itself as a commodity. Let's look at the cheapest alternative to get you where you want to go. Okay. So that would be my advice for sure about that Roth. And, and you know, look, if you ended up opening an extra general investment account with some extra money in your cash, you know, like if you said, oh, I'll keep 105 and I'll start with 15,000 and something else, that's fine too. I would definitely look to be keeping my costs down. That's really okay. the best way to approach it. Speaking of costs, yes. the funds that I'm invested in in my 401k are like 0.41 in like point uh, four two around there. I'm not sure how that compares to other things. So I do see the index funds that we have available to us for stock and bond or yeah, stock and bonds. And those are like point oh four. Yeah, I like so those better. Yeah, there's a ten percent difference. Yeah, I like that just, better. I like that better. So um, I mean are the what are the funds that have those higher fees? Can you tell me what they are? Um one is the target date for twenty fifty. Yeah. And the other ones are two growth uh, funds. I sent them in the email to Mark. So that's why they're more expensive. Yeah, go to an index fund. A nice big index fund for stocks, a nice big index fund for bonds, and now you are just basically taking, let's call call it 40 basis points and adding that to your bottom line. In other words, if you were going, every year as an investor, we start the year in the hole by a certain percentage, right? That's the cost of the fund every year. And, you know, right now, if you're starting in the hole at a half of a percent, it would be nice to start in the hole at, you know, four or five basis points. That's what an index fund's going to cost you. So, yeah, do that. And um, the target date fund, by the way, tends to be a bit more risky. So I know you're young, but just make sure you feel comfortable with the amount of risk you're uh, assuming. Um, in general, what I've been telling a lot of people who are your age who are like, I've got 100 percent in stocks is like, you know, you, it's fine. But I certainly would be just as fine saying 80-20. That's an aggressive growth fund. You don't have to be 100% in stocks. Gotcha. Okay. What else? That, I, you answered the next question I had, which was what percentage to likely be at 80 stocks, 20 yeah. bonds. I mean, if you're aggressive, for sure. Look, there's going to be some I've got sell-off. have a lot of time. Yeah, you've got yeah, a lot of time. Was. There's going to be a sell-off. You do have a lot of time, but just understand that you know, when the market drops, it is nice to have that little bond position, just a little buffer. It's not going to be pleasant either way, but a buffer is always good. And yeah. um, I think that that's a reasonable allocation. And I would keep rocking and rolling and move that account out of uh, Edward Jones and go from there. I think that's a, I think you're in great shape. Awesome. All right. That's keep really doing what you're doing, man. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I of, appreciate your advice. Of course. Take care. Take care. Bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to the program. Remember, there are new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. You can download them by going to the website jillonmoney.com. You can also subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, we haven't asked for this in a while. How about a little comment about how we're doing? Maybe if you're floating around Apple, do that for us. That would be great. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. We're distributed by Cadence 13. Our executive producer extraordinaire is Mark Talercio, and we're sponsored by Betterment. See you next week.